Um, I'd like to welcome our um, esteemed panelists who are joining us today, Senator Kate Brophy McGee, Representative Daniel Hernandez, and Representative and Dr. Ami Shaw. Um, also joining us today is Dr. Kiki Trailer from Amgen. And I'd like to thank the team at Amgen for um, supporting this panel and for everything that they're doing for us, both during Arizona Bioscience Week and um, on behalf of patients all over the world. Um, Kiki, would you like to say a few words? Sure, I just wanted to thank our legislators for joining us today and for supporting Arizona Bio and the bioscience sector in Arizona. And Amgen is proud and happy to sponsor this particular event and we look forward to a great discussion. Terrific, thank you so much, Kiki. And again, thank you to Amgen. So one of the things that we were talking about um, before this call with our panelists, but also a hot topic in the community is COVID-19. It has impacted our health, it's impacted our families, it's impacted our jobs, um, and it's impacted our way of life. And one of the things that I get over and over and over again is what's taking so long and you know how can you guys help you're supposed to have all the answers well the answer is that with this novel virus we don't have all the answers but this pace of innovation is moving faster on finding answers for this particular disease than we have ever been able to have make progress on before here in the United States, we have nine different vaccines that are in different stages of clinical trials. We have over a thousand different tests that have been developed all around the world. And these include the first tests, which were PCR tests that are used to diagnose when someone is ill. Um, those were followed by the serology tests so that we can take the pulse of our community and see how many people have been infected and recovered so that we have an idea of where we are. And we hope, we don't know, but we hope that you cannot get this again. Um, and then lastly, we now have antigen tests, which are going through the process. Um, we have two that have received FDA EUAs, including one from Becton Dickinson, who's the Arizona Bioscience Company of the Year this year. Uh, we also are seeing drug therapies, both old and new, that are being deployed to help patients. And equally important, um, you know, we are working faster than it has ever been done in history to get new vaccines so that they are available to protect those of us that are at that have greater health risks. And this is really important that all of us that are healthy get our flu vaccine. That starts to create what we call a herd immunity, where if I'm vaccinated and Kate's vaccinated and Daniel's vaccinated and Amisha's vaccinated and Frederick's vaccinated, then we are creating a barrier around those people who couldn't be vaccinated. And it's less likely that the disease will be transferred to them. As I, our doctors on the call know, um, just because you have um, the flu doesn't mean you can't get COVID. And just because you can't get COVID doesn't mean you can't get the flu. So the last thing we want is for you to have both at once. So all of us have the ability to get our flu shots. They are available. I've gotten mine, my husband's gotten his, and it's very, very important that we all do our part. With that, um, one of the things that we've really talked about is, you know, what are some of the things that are happening? And you've, many of you have seen, um, you know, um, either television or web broadcasts that include Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, um, the team from the FDA, um, and so many others that are working on this at the federal level. At the state level, you may not know how much is being done right here in Arizona. 
up north in northern Arizona, we have TGen North, and TGen North is working with NAU. And from the very, very earliest stages of this pandemic, when we just had a handful of cases in the United States, they were working on finding the genetic source of this disease so we could work on it better. In Tempe, a little company called GenoSensor started collaborating with their friends in Wuhan, China, and started working on a diagnostic PCR test that was for an EUA authorization on April the 16th of this year, making it the first FDA EUA to an Arizona company for a diagnostic test for COVID-19. In other parts of the state, down at the University of Arizona, um, we have one of the leading rep, um, experts in the world on ARDS. And ARDS is the acute respiratory distress system that patients with severe cases of COVID get, which puts them on respirators. And as we all know, you know, our, once you get that sick and you reach that stage, it can be um, not the best outcome. So Skip Garcia and his team have been working on repositioning drugs to come up with new, better solutions. We're seeing new tests being deployed. Did you know that TGen from the very beginning has been working with some of our disadvantaged communities to provide testing to communities that wouldn't necessarily have it? And down in Southern Arizona, um, one of the very first antigen tests was being developed at UVA so that, as Bobby Robbins said, they'd be able to test 60,000 people so that we can start getting a handle on this disease. At ASU, at the Biodesign Institute, they were able to take equipment that they had actually acquired um, to do robotic qPCR testing for people that were exposed to radiation under a program called BARDA. And they were able to pivot and use that same federally funded equipment at the Biodesign Institute to develop new tests so that they could rapidly test for COVID. So when we started to surge, and it was more than Sonora Quest could handle, ASU was able to step up and really start to supplement the testing that was being done in the state. Now, on top of that, I hope that most of you have not had to have a nasal pharyngeal swab stuck up your nose and tickling your brain, but it's not a pleasant thing. So the team at ASU developed a saliva test, which is now being used in Arizona. So instead of having that nasty swab stuck up your nose, you get to spit through a straw into a tube and they can do your COVID test and they're turning it around in a matter of days. Now, here in Arizona, our numbers are coming down. Unfortunately, our testing numbers are going down too. Arizona, as of this morning, ranked 43rd in the country for its ranking of the number of tests being done on the population as a factor of its of 10,000. So that means that where we are 14th by population, we are 43rd in testing. It's not that we don't have the testing capacity, it's that we don't have the testing subjects. So one of the things that we need to do is we need to test. We need to rapidly get responses and we need to get that information back so we can contact trace. So that as we continue to move forward, we can monitor the health of our community. We even have scientists at both University of Arizona and at ASU that have stepped up and are testing wastewater. Now you would say, why are they doing that? Well, it turns out that our bodies throw off virus in the things that we throw off into the toilet. And so they are able to take samples of the wastewater that are coming out of a community and then test that using PCR technology so that we can see if numbers start to go up. We can then start giving our healthcare leaders a heads up that, that, that we need to get prepared in that particular community. This is also going to be especially important as we're getting our kids back to school, because just as we can do that on a zip code, we can tap into the sewer line outside of the school. 
and see if something is changing and give that information to the administration so that they can do appropriate measures. So the investments that Arizona has made in the biosciences, thanks to our partnership with the legislature, and importantly, the people of Arizona, who every time they purchase something, a tiny fraction of their sales tax goes to fund innovation in the life sciences, that is stepping up to create heroes all over the state who are working tirelessly right now to help us all get through this. So um, that's just a quick overview of some of the people that are working on this and to give you an idea of what's happening globally, nationally, and here at the local level for innovation. Um, I'd also like to make sure everybody on the call and all of your friends know, so take notes on this and spread the news. On Wednesday the 16th at 7 p.m., we will have the premiere of Celebrating Life and Science. It's the very first time that AZBio has ever produced a television program. And for those of you that know me, if you can tell my hair is now grayer than it was before. But it is a wonderful program that shows the people of Arizona some of the stories I was just talking about. And it's also spotlights our students and the things that we've done. And, um, and with that, I'd like to um, pivot a little bit. And um, I'm going to start asking questions instead of answering questions. And we're going to talk with our wonderful elected leaders. To start things off, what I'd like to do is ask each of our panelists um, to give a brief about two minutes, who you are, why you're doing what you're doing, and um, some of the things that you're doing right now. And then we'll go back into those questions a little deeper. But uh, ladies first, Senator Brophy McGee, would you like to kick us off? Uh, my name is Kate Brophy McGee. I'm the state senator for Legislative District 28. I have been in the legislature for 10 years, and the last four serving in the Arizona Senate. I am chair of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee, and I co-chair the DCS Oversight Committee, and I'm also serve. I also serve on three councils and commissions through the Governor's Office of Youth, Faith, and Family, uh, which tangentially have been impacted by COVID. The Commission to Prevent Domestic Violence, the Family, a Child Safety and Family Empowerment Council, Council, and also the Human Trafficking Council, which is chaired by Cindy McCain. So uh, my work, in, if I'm, we're gonna just put aside the fact that I have this in, huge campaign that I am running and I wanna focus on my legislative work. I love what I do because it gives me the opportunity to help my constituents, to help Arizona businesses and to help people towards a greater goal, which I say is building the Arizona we love and our children and grandchildren will call home. Joan, I can't thank you enough for your incredible work in the biosciences. One of the very first things that happened to me as a legislature, legislator when I first took office in 2011 was I was given the opportunity to join the Flynn Foundation's Bioscience Roadmap. And I have followed the incredible developments of the Arizona bioscience industry, and we really have carved out a niche and are gaining a solid foothold uh, in this industry. It's, and just to have the opportunity to witness that firsthand and go down to the Capitol and fight for those angel funds and, and be successful in winning, um, that, that has meant the world to me. The pandemic has created multiple opportunities to serve my constituents and I'm working very hard from the basic necessities, uh, unemployment, housing assistance, um, it just health insurance, access to health insurance, um, all of these things. Um, and at the same time, I am serving on the governor's long-term care facility task force as we seek for safe ways to reopen our long-term care facilities. It is heartbreaking to see our elderly and our vulnerable uh, distanced from their families, 
kept in these homes and, and literally, quite literally, dying from loneliness as their families stand outside, quite literally, watching this happen through the window. So we came together as a group and said we can do better and still protect these vulnerable patients. So those are those are some of the things that I've been working on. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to Dr. Shaw. When the pandemic first hit, he left his post by his desk in, on the house floor and went down to the emergency room, rolled up his sleeves and went to work. And um, I had the courage to call him about three weeks into the, what I knew was just a horrible, horrible virus and pandemic and check with him that he was safe. But I have to tell you, I've worried about him every <laughs> single day and pray for me. So thank you for what you do. Thank you, Senator Brophy McGee. And uh, Representative Hernandez, uh, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about you and your work in Southern Arizona? Uh, thank you, Joan. It's always fun to be on a panel with Dr. Amish Shah, my colleague in the House, and Senator Kate Brophy McGee. I think Kate and I end up doing like half of the panels available for organizations um, because it's a a lot of fun to be on a panel with her um, but it really shows the importance of bipartisanship and being able to break through some of the partisan gridlock to be able to get things done so i really enjoy the opportunity this year i enjoyed the opportunity this year to work with joan to start the first ever arizona legislative bio uh <laughs> yes claps to that uh uh caucus at the legislature to look specifically at biosciences. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we had a grand total of one in-person meeting um, before COVID stopped us from being able to continue to bring in experts from the outside. So I'm excited that we were able to start this bipartisan caucus to be able to talk about issues related to the industry. And hopefully in the next couple months, identify a new Republican co-chair in the House and then hopefully expand it to the Senate so that we can continue to have these conversations. For a little bit of background, I started um, coming to the Capitol when I was 18 years old, um, working on issues that I cared about, including education. But at the same time, I started doing research at the University of Arizona Cancer Center through the Keys uh, program at the University of Arizona. So for me, doing actual work in a wet lab, then doing bioinformatics, really showed me and opened my eyes to the importance of the biosciences. Ever since, I've been really passionate about doing more to expand opportunities for young people um, like myself to get that experience like I had when I was 17 and 18 doing the Keys Bioscience Program and also um, the Summer Institutes on Medical Ignorance at the University of Arizona. When I served as a school board member, I worked to expand our biosciences programs at the Sunnyside Unified School District, um, increasing career and technical education opportunities. And after serving there for a few years, I ran for the legislature with a mindset of how do we take what's working in Southern Arizona, particularly at places like Sunnyside and the University of Arizona and also Pima Community College and expand those opportunities so all kids in Arizona have the opportunity to explore these as viable career pathways. Because if you don't see this as something that is even available, you're never gonna know that you can go into these fields. So with that, I'll hand it off to um, one of my good friends in the house, uh, Dr. Ami Shah. Ami, you're up. Th thank you, Joan. Um, and, and thank you to my other two legislators, both of whom uh, I, I consider real friends. Um, I, uh, Joan, thanks for the opportunity and thanks for putting this together. This can't be easy to do during a pandemic. And I know how hard you've worked to, to, to make sure this, this happens and, and to make sure that there are links between industry and the people of Arizona and the legislature, specifically with regard to biosciences. It's, it's critically important. And, and I just really applaud the work you're doing. I want to say thank you to my colleague, uh, Senator Brophy McGee for the kind words. I, I really appreciate that. And, uh, Thanks for thinking of me. I, I, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, working with her so far. We, we've uh, collaborated <laughs> and talked about a lot of health policy over my freshman term. So I'm, I'm a freshman. 
and uh, it's 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 been a real pleasure uh, working with you. We've 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 done a lot of bills uh, together, and that's that's uh, I I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, and my friend Daniel Hernandez, uh, who has also served uh, along with Senator Murphy McGee as as a mentor uh, and uh, a real friend. Uh, he he's taught me a lot about. <laughs> Process and policy, and and uh, I, I without his mentorship, it would have been uh, harder to make it through the first two years and and that steep learning curve. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, I uh, I want to give you a little bit about my background. I'm a physician. I'm an emergency physician. For those of you who don't know, I've been practicing for over 15 years. Um, I also did sports medicine for a while. I worked for the NFL back in New York, and uh, I came out here. I went to the U of A for a sports medicine fellowship, ended up staying, wanted to put down some roots into the community with charity work. Uh, and then that led to <laughs> politics. I went to one meeting, kind of got drafted and, and ended up running and, and now here we are. Um, and so I'm a member of the House uh, Health and Human Services Committee. Uh, and uh, a lot of the bills that we put forward this year and pushed through the House were of course health related. Uh, I think, Joan, you've, you've been wonderful in helping me sort of push a lot of those bills through, things that are important for our entire community. Yeah. Um, the prior authorization bill was one that was uh, a real success. I can't take credit for writing it. That actually came from John and Morris and, and Arma, so I'll never take credit for, for something that these guys put together and actually worked with industry on. Um, but but uh, we were able to get everybody in the room together work on it, revision, 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 and, and put it through in a bipartisan way. It was, it was really a, a great thing, and it, and it helps the people of Arizona. For those that don't know, prior auth is when you go to the doctor and he has to get, uh, he or she has to get a form filled out from the insurance company saying, hey, look, this is, this is okay to do, so we don't, as a society, spend on unnecessary things. Well, we, we could really streamline the process by bringing it down to a uniform uh, form. And that's kind of what we did and agreed on. And that, and that, that really will save a lot of people healthcare delays and cost. And, and, and we were really proud of that effort. And that's, that's just one of them. Um, so uh, I hope to continue doing more of this kind of work next year. And uh, this, this COVID epidemic has, has clearly thrown a curveball in there for all of us down there at the legislature. It, it's the big thing. And we're, we're trying as best we can to respond to all of our constituents and and, and make sure to address the, the the multiple aspects, whether it's the public health or the economics, um, and then eventually like sort of the after effects that, that don't get anticipated. So um, again, thanks for, for having me on the panel. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for, for bringing up some of the bills that, that you know didn't get to the finish line um, due to the fact that we had to truncate the session this year. Um, you know, we were very lucky to get the R&D tax credit and the additional hospital funding done before we ended the session, because those R&D dollars and those hospital dollars have been essential during this very challenging time. Um, but interestingly, um, there's another very critical program for our entrepreneurs, um, which is what we call the angel tax credit um, it's actually, you know, in the legislature and in statute, it's the small business investment um, tax credit. But Daniel, I know you've been very involved in working with the technology community and talking to them about um, the importance of that tax credit. And I know um, you might want to be able to share a little bit with our audience on, you know, where you see you've seen some of the discussions. Right. I think the big thing is to acknowledge that nothing gets done at the legislature by one person. Um, so working on the angel tax credit has definitely been a big group effort. Um, I've engaged a lot with the Arizona Technology Council on how do we get this across the finish line? Because this year, unfortunately, it got stalled because of COVID. But to be quite frank, it also got stalled because what we've seen is the far right and the far left both agreeing that they hate this bill, but for entirely different reasons. So folks on the far right say, government shouldn't be getting involved in picking winners and losers. And then some of my colleagues on the far left saying, we don't wanna fund anything until we fund education, no more tax credits, exemptions, nothing. That kind of attitude makes it really difficult to bring the people that we need to together to make sure that we actually 
get to the 31 votes needed in the House and the 16 in the Senate. My concern going into next year is that because the bill didn't pass this year, we have a really truncated timeline to get it passed before the program expires in June 30, sorry, June 30th of 2021. So one of the potential opportunities that we'll have to explore is whether we introduce it with an emergency clause, which if we do it with an emergency clause would get around the general effective date, which is sometime in August if we finish in May or June. But the problem with that is it necessitates a higher threshold for how many votes we have to get. So we were having issues where both sides were kind of peeling people off and there was a core group. And I honestly believe that we had the 31 votes in the House and likely the 16 votes in the Senate to get it passed. But because of partisan politics, it wasn't put up on the board for a final vote on the House floor, even though it had gone through the committee process and been vetted for years. But now, not only do we have to look at the potential for having a 31 vote, if we let the program expire, then we can go with just 31. If we want to do an emergency clause and move this so that as soon as it gets passed and signed by the governor, it goes into effect, we would need a two-thirds majority in both chambers, which would mean we'd need 40 votes in the House. That is a much higher threshold than the uh, 31, and it doesn't sound like a lot to say we just need nine more votes. But getting to the 31 was a challenge. So what I would say to folks on this call is if you haven't already, schedule time to talk to the legislators that have interest in your, sorry, that you have interest in their district, whether you have a facility, whether you have employees, or whether you are their constituent. Because if we don't start talking about this now in September, when it comes to January, February, or March, whenever this bill gets moving, it'll be too late to talk to them for the first time and try and convince them. What we're gonna have to battle is a lot of folks that are gonna be kind of going to both sides, especially with the partisanship as it is at the Capitol, we need to start engaging and educating our friends and our colleagues. So what I'd love to do at some point is when we start having virtual bioscience sessions, maybe one of them, we talk about the importance of the angel tax credit on the industry so that my colleagues can start understanding this isn't just a giveaway for big corporations as some of my colleagues have characterized it. And it's also not picking winners and losers. It's creating an opportunity to take a thriving industry to the next level. And it provides an opportunity for a lot of these startups to actually be able to scale their workout so that it can go from a business like one that mentioned was mentioned by Joan, that's a small startup in you know, Tempe that's able to do some really important work on things like coronavirus, but medical innovation and the biosciences won't stop once COVID is no longer the main topic. It's gonna to have to be a conversation that's ongoing and investments from Arizona, especially something as small as the angel investment tax credit are going to be key to growing the industry so that they're not going to Denver, so that they're not going to uh, California, so that we can attract them here and keep them here in Arizona. Thank you, Daniel. and. Kate, you know, as chair of health committee, you sponsored a very important bill this year that unfortunately also didn't get it to the finish line um, on our newborn screening programs. And for the people on the phone that may not be aware, um, when your baby is born or your grandbaby, in my case, is born um, and they take those little spots of blood and put it on the card, we use that to do testing on diseases that can be life-threatening for newborns. And we can do the screening very quickly. There's something called the RUSC, which is the Re Recommended Uniform Screening Panel, which is recommended by the federal government, but has to be adopted by states. And here in Arizona, because of the way the, the law is structured, um, we have four diseases right now that we're not screening for and we actually have treatments now that can help change the lives of these children. So um, Senator Brophy McGee really stepped up and championed this. I know Governor Ducey was championing this. We just didn't get it to the finish line. Um, but I, I really wanna thank you for all of your work and I hope that you're gonna carry that flag again for us next year. What do you think, Kate? Uh, I'm absolutely all in. We had very compelling testimony uh, from yeah. 
individuals who were not diagnosed quickly enough to get them the treatment that was needed for two conditions. And Joan, you're going to have to remind me what they were, but um, it's it's tragic because if we can simply do that screening when the when the baby is born, then we can avert so much. And they were there to testify. There was a little kind of kerfuffle around what the fees look like. Um, a lot of my conservative colleagues get very wrapped around the axle about fees and taxes and increases, but I think we had that very well navigated and we were headed for the finish line when the pandemic hit. So uh, I still am having individuals write me and say, where are we on the bill? So one of the things that uh, President Fan had mentioned was to take some of these active bills that were really, well, like uh, the prior off that uh, Amish worked on, that were headed towards the finish line and really assign them a preferred status so we can get them reintroduced and get them out um, and up to the governor sooner rather than later. Um, as a sideline, I want to commit to Daniel to work with him very diligently on the angel fund uh, tax credit. It's somewhat concerning to me when I look, it's $10 million and that's great, but I think we need to look at what other states are doing with far bigger funds or far greater funds because there is an influx of business and businesses and startups who are moving here from California. And I think if we can create, we have obviously the lifestyle, um, the affordability that is desired, but I think if we can also create uh, an in more additional incentives to help them build and grow their businesses, uh, that would benefit Arizona enormously. So um, we will get that done this next session, I promise. Well, and thank you. And you, the federal government is actually supporting AZ Bio. Um, AZ Bio is working on AZ advances. So, for those of you on the call that aren't familiar with that, we will actually have a session on AZ advances on Wednesday afternoon. Check in your app for the schedule. Um, but the concept is in the United Kingdom, there is an organization called the Welcome Trust. The Welcome Trust started with a very small endowment, which has grown over the years, and they are now the largest innovation engine in the world for fund, privately funding research and innovation in the life sciences. There's nothing like the Welcome Trust in the United States. And so we went to the U.S. Department of Commerce and the EDA and asked for their help in putting together a plan to raise an endowment of $200 million um, that could then be invested and would yield $10 million in early stage investment into life science companies in Arizona every year forever with no more, no more money going into it. And then instead of having those investments be held by private individuals, which is, you know, a little bit of the feedback that I've heard, you know, well, why are we making it easier for those people to invest? Um, this would be held inside the charity. And so this endowment, which would be only for Arizona, this endowment would continue to grow just like the Welcome Trust grew and would be able to um, fund good ideas, invest in, in, in innovations coming out of the university, and also support programs like Keats or other programs like right now, I don't know if any of you have voted yet, but if you go on the AZ Bio website under the events tab, look for the Student Discovery Zone Challenge competition. That is being supported by the foundation that we've established for, for AZ Advances, um, D3 Bio and OTEP. And um, we have students from across the state and they have two minute videos where they're explaining their science projects and you can then vote up the ones you like and then this, the university and the high school student with the most scores are going to get a scholarship. So those are ways that we can, you know, even in these distance times, take care of the students, which I just love our students. Now, Daniel and Kate, I know both of you have worked and, and Amish, I think you've also been involved in these discussions too, um, on TRIP. You know, Kate, you were um, on the lead with Doug Coleman 
of getting that bill, you know, taken to the finish line to extend the Prop 301 funding uh, through 2041, but um, it's not voter protected anymore. And so it's gonna be critically important. And that was something that I had truly hoped we'd be voting on this year. Um, but it's gonna be critically important that we as a community come together on what those allocations should look like and protect that funding so that we're continuing to make those investments in not just research, but in education. Dr. Shah, I know you're a huge fan of educating our next generation. <laughs> Edu education got me where I am. I, I wouldn't be where I am without my teachers and the encouragement I got. I, I went to a high school that was um, very, very similar to Brophy uh, in Chicago and, um, you know, sister school, Jesuit high school. And um, I, I'm thankful for all the people that believed in me. We didn't grow up wealthy at all. And um, I was just very um, lucky. And I, I feel that there's uh, some part of me that really wants to make sure we pay that forward and, and make sure that every student gets the opportunity they, they deserve. And I want to I want to add um, to what uh, Senator Brophy McGee and what uh, Rep. Hernandez talked about with regard to the angel tax investment credit. Um, th there are incubators that are it, there's one in my district and one just outside my district. And I, I've been there. I've seen what they do and they provide our young people opportunities for when they they you know get into the young part of their career. So it is it's a vital part of that pipeline and keeping the startup ecology going. So I, I'm also a fan. I just wanted to add that of, of that that credit. But and you know Mish, that just gave me an idea. Daniel, um since once it's safe for us to have meetings with more than you know 50 people, um one of the things we might want to think about is having one of the bioscience caucus meetings at the Center for Entrepreneurial Innovation, which is close enough to the legislature to do it. Um, and let some of the leaders that need to understand the importance of the angel tax credit actually walk through the labs and see some of the cool stuff that's going on. That might be a real effective way of doing it. What do you think? I, I like that idea, and it's always fun to have field trips as legislators because um, you get to see and talk to and ask questions. Um, we've done any Arizona manufacturing tours, um, but I think the idea of doing one specifically on bioscience and looking at some of these different institutions that help really support innovators is really, really important. So that's a great idea. And at AZ Bio's board of directors meets every quarter, and we only got to meet in person one time this year. And it was at Medtronic, where we got to see some of the amazing work that's being done there. And Kate, you were on hand to, to speak to the community then. And what are some of the things you got to see? Uh, it was amazing. It was the whole presentation was amazing. And I guess what I was most impressed with besides the projects that were presented were, were was the youth and enthusiasm of these innovators. And I have been in correspondence with a couple of them ever since. I think if my colleagues, Daniels and Amisha's and my colleagues at the legislature, legislature had a chance to meet these folks up close and personal and really look at the amazing work that they are doing, it sells itself. Um, there, there are so many things that have been highlighted as a result of the work we've done with uh, the Biosciences Caucus and the Flynn Foundation Bioscience Steering Committee really coming to life in the last couple of years. I think we're standing on the threshold of real breakthroughs about the role that bioscience plays in our Arizona economy. And I know my colleagues are going to be looking for those opportunities uh, as we try to move forward and out of the devastation of this pandemic. Well, one of the things that we've been working on is communication, right? Because we can't all be together right now. Um, so AZ Business Magazine, which I know many of you get and read, there are 56 pages on the biosciences in AZ Business Magazine 
this month. So watch for those. Um, the Best Companies Edition is coming out right now. Um, I know that they're in the mail. There's also um, a version of it that you can view online on Issue um, that has some phenomenal stories. And then once we can be together again, AZ Bios, um, the, the magazine that we give all of you at the legislature, which has the AZ Bio member directory, the policy guide, and that combined, um, I have 500 coming to me and my husband is not gonna want them to stay in my guest room. So I will be making sure that they all get to you. So um, I wanna remind our viewers, and it's, it's, I love it when I see the screen filling up the way it has over the last 40, 40 minutes or so. Um, I wanna remind our viewers that you do have the chat button and you are welcome. We have a couple of questions that were sent in early, but you do have the ability to add questions that you would like to ask in the chat. And I will direct them to our panelists in this last 15 minutes. Um, so, <laughs> thank you, Daniel. Um, and so, um, you know, as we're going forward, and I think this panel is about the path forward. We've talked about some of the things that we were doing last year that we want to get done. Um, but Kate, what are some of the things that, that you're kind of thinking about? Um, I'm not thinking much past the 3rd of November currently. But with the assumption and the hope and the prayer that I then return to the legislature, I'm going to pick up right where I left off. Um, there are some really important things, work we're doing, obviously around the biosciences, obviously within the health care community. And there is going to be so much more on our plate as a result of the things that we've learned from this pandemic. It really has been like building the airplane while you are flying. Yeah. And since I am horribly uh, adept at mixing metaphors, uh, I continue to look for the ability to take these sour lemons, these bad things that have happened, and to have good come from it to make lemonade. And I think we will have many of those opportunities. I think we will have come through um, definitely older and wiser and with a far greater awareness and appreciation of science uh, than we have had previously and the important role that it plays. And just looking at the recap that you that you made at Joan at the beginning about all the things that were being done throughout the state of Arizona uh, on behalf of COVID treatment and COVID uh, vaccines and COVID everything else, um, it really takes me back to the billion dollar bond bonding mm -hmm. capacity we approved for the universities. We need to go back and review that and review our funding to our universities to ensure, again, with the impacts of COVID on their tennis, we really have to make sure that they are supported going forward so this marvelous innovation can continue. I cannot begin to tell you how committed I am to that. I'm gonna digress just one little bit and talk about the substance abuse overdose deaths and things that are on the rise as a result of the pandemic. Um, one of the things that we must do is to go back and close the loopholes around the prescription database monitor monitoring system uh, because there are many loopholes that allow um, access to multiple prescriptions of opioids uh, through various populations like the Medicare population. That was a bill I had that was going through that didn't make it. And, and it truly is a patient safety issue. And I think we're going to have a lot more work to do um, in those arenas. And I know that the scientists and the innovators that are under your care, Joan, uh, will, will be there so that w this can happen. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you, Kate. And Amish, you know, since we're talking about the science, I'm going to defer to the scientist here. Um, 
you know, as, as we look forward, we have so many opportunities in science. Um, but we also have a lot of challenges in, you know, getting the science to the finish line here. That's why AZ Bio is working so hard on access to early stage capital because we've put almost all of our investments as a state in two places. We either invest in the research and discovery phase or in the healthcare delivery phase. And when you combine the state as well as private philanthropy and industry investment, we're now approaching $22 billion invested to build the biosciences. And an amazing story by Amanda Morris in the Arizona Republic, if you didn't read it, um, it came out yesterday, I read it this morning, um, talking about you know, in Phoenix, how they're building the biosciences and the level of investment that's coming in on top of what we've already done. But to um, get those innovations to the finish line, we, we need clinical trials. We need to make sure that these technologies are happening. Um, Dr. Shaw, you probably are pretty familiar with some breaking clinical trials right now, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, I am. So, so I used to be an academic, um, teacher, teaching physician uh, during my, my time in uh, New York and uh, then um, I haven't, haven't really been in teaching. I haven't been teaching medical students in residence here in the state of Arizona other than my fellowship at the U of A. But um, yeah, I'm very familiar with um, how research works and, and how um, it's very important that we, we continue to produce knowledge in this way and how, how good it is for for all of us that are involved. Um, specifically, right now, there are COVID-19 vaccine trials going on in Arizona. And uh, we, we actually, we uh, heard about this through, you know, our physician groups and also it was in the Arizona Republic. And um, I, uh, I had been reading the information that's been coming through on several of these vaccines, the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, um, and, um, so I, I actually did myself call them up and enroll myself in the trial. And I, I got wow. myself a, a shot last week. Um, and, and so it's, it's good because it's, it's also service to humanity. I, I, when I read the phase two trials, I, I know that the, uh, vast majority, if not, if not a hundred percent of people developed antibodies and, and the adverse reactions, at least in the Pfizer and Moderna trials, were uh, were not there. No serious adverse reactions. So, um, you know, again, we, we don't know. That's why we do phase three trials. Um, and um, you know, I I, I hope that uh, we'll we'll get a positive result from this. But uh, I did enroll myself, and I, I did spread that information to several of my friends. It's a funny story when I went in and. Uh, talk to them and I asked them, so have a lot of people been coming in? Are you guys, what, how are you guys doing with enrollment? They told me that, yeah, we're, we've filled up really fast. People want this. And, uh, and I said, well, what's the typical person look like? And they said, you wouldn't believe it. It's a lot of doctors that are coming in here asking for this vaccine and specifically emergency doctors. So I said, uh, I see, I guess most of my colleagues are, are, are really interested. So um, I think to, to more of your point, though, as far as what we're going to see later, we we will eventually have a vaccine that works. I, I don't know how long that's going to take. I, I can't guess. Some say it's as soon as November. Some say it'll be late next year, even a year away. I, I, I can't say. But um, it uh, it is uh, it's going to happen. And during that time, we're going to need to facilitate the delivery of the state in a way that um, does it in an organized and efficient manner for sure. Uh, and, and that's going to be another challenge. I, I know that the logistics are going to be yet another challenge. And then that's something that's going to, uh, for all three of us here, the legislators are, are going to probably face as an issue. And you know, one of the challenges, and I, I can tell you based on some of the task forces that I'm sitting on at the, the federal level, um, we really look at the flu vaccination this fall as our dress rehearsal for COVID vaccinations when those vaccines have been shown to be safe and effective. 
And so one of the things we're really asking everyone is go get that flu shot. We want to get the flu population or the, the flu vaccination rates, you know, up into that 80% range because that's what we're going to be shooting for when we get to, to the next level. So helping our healthcare supply chain prepare for that, um, the flu vaccine is our dress rehearsal. And so, you know, please spread the word to everyone you know about the importance of going to get that vaccination. I've seen in some of our um, northern Arizona communities, they've already set up drive through vaccinations, which is kind of cool. You drive your car up, they pop you in the arm and you keep going. I kind of like that one. Um, but, you know, as we continue, we need to look at that. The other thing we need to look at, and I do know um, all three of you have been very involved in this, is the issue of health disparities. Because um, what's available to my family is not necessarily what's available to our migrant worker com community, to our less affluent communities, um, and to some of our rural communities. And that is something we're facing right now and discussing not just at the state level, but also at the federal level. How do we address those health disparities as we move forward? Any ideas, Daniel? And I'll start off by talking about, as someone who represents a district that is both urban and rural, um, I've seen these disparities even in my own district. I represent Santa Cruz County. And despite the fact that the guidelines had changed several times from both the Department of Health and from the CDC as to who was qualified to be able to take a COVID-19 test, I found out that the one major provider of tests in Santa Cruz County, the Mariposa Health Centers, had for the first two months of the pandemic, only 250 test kits total for a county that has 50,000 people. They were only testing people who had been exposed to someone that was sick or was in the hospital. So this was a terrible situation to be in for the first two months of the pandemic. Or yes, there were disparities across the state, but to see in Tucson people being able to get a test who you know, just wanted peace of mind or wanted to make sure that they could get back to work. And yet in my district in Santa Cruz County, it wasn't until I found out that they only had 250 total tests from the beginning to about two months in that I then had to step in as a lawmaker and harangue, harass, volunteer, voluntold, and do whatever I needed to to get more tests down there. But that's one of the big things that when we think about our healthcare distribution system, we oftentimes only think about the big metro areas, Tucson, Phoenix, and Flagstaff. But the reality is the people who are the most at risk and some of the folks who have the least amount of information a lot of the times are in these rural communities. So part of the disparities solution, I think, is making sure that we expand broadband access because there are so many places where it says really easy, just do a telemedicine visit, just do a video call with your doctor. But if you don't have access to broadband, you can't do that. Um, we're seeing right now with issues around the post office where people are getting their medications delivered to their homes and they're being delayed. And for somebody who's trying to get something like insulin, that could be a very, very serious situation if you don't have your medication. So as we're looking at how do we invest to make sure that we're attracting more jobs, how do we strengthen the resources that are available to all Arizonans, regardless of what area of the state they live in. And I think that's a really crucial question that we need to address as we come back into the next session. Um, the Latino community particularly is disproportionately impacted by negative healthcare outcomes because of COVID. A lot of it has to do with pre-existing conditions, but also a lot of it has to do with a lot of folks in these communities just don't have the same levels of access to insurance and to primary care physicians. So they may have something that is a chronic disease that's totally treatable, but because they don't have the ability to find a physician that can see them regularly, their mild case of diabetes, their mild case of you name it, will be escalated. And when we're in the middle of a pandemic like COVID, an untreated diabetic may be at a higher risk of being hospitalized and potentially passing away. So we need to find how do we get better outcomes. So that's going to be something that working with our federal partners to increase funding for those federally qualified health centers across the state. And the last thing I'll say, and I really have to commend Amish for really putting his money where his mouth is, 
getting the vaccine is critical, but getting more people of color, particularly in our Native American and Latino communities, is going to be crucial to make sure that it's not only safe for some, but safe for all. A lot of these clinical trials have a lot of success getting folks who are the most likely to sign up and know about these uh, studies. But for those that don't know and aren't used to signing up, participating in medical studies, we have to do a lot more legwork. So I know I've been working with Univision and Telemundo to try and raise awareness in the Spanish speaking community and in the Latino community that these are trials where we need young, healthy Latinos to step up and, and take this uh, opportunity and actually participate in these trials. So I know that was a long answer to your question, but I think they're all interconnected because as we know, if we don't have some of these basic infrastructures delivering healthcare and healthcare innovations is going to be very difficult when, when a vaccine is ready. And um, so I'm going to, we're going to need to start wrapping things up. And so um, we're going to go to closing comments. Um, now, there was a question that came through and, and we don't have enough time to go through it in depth right now which is that very delicate balancing act between investing in innovation and ensuring that patients have access to and can afford their medicines. That's a really important and complex discussion and I hope that we can continue that discussion um, at a point in the future. Um, but we're, we are running out of time right now. Um, so I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to give me just a one minute Closing comment, um, we will start with Senator Brophy McGee and then go to Representative Hernandez and then Dr. Shaw. Um, but Kate, you wanna kind of bring it home? It's hard to give a politician only a minute. But <laughs> one of the reasons I love working with the healthcare community so much is because they are problem solvers. And we have, as Daniel pointed out, those rural urban divides, those underserved areas, those underserved populations. And we have some very good models we can work from. Uh, for instance, the maternal mortality morbidity bill that I passed uh, two sessions ago, we can take that type of model and apply it going forward to ensuring that we get access uh, to to healthcare for these patients. Um, the other piece that, and I really appreciate Daniel's point on broadband. We must solve that problem, not just for healthcare, but also for education. And we have made many attempts during my 20 years in public service, I've watched the state do it. We must be successful. And I think we have the funds on hand for that to happen. So it's really been a pleasure to speak to you all, and I really appreciate your time and the great information that you've shared and the incredible work you all do. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Daniel? Uh, since I already talked for such a long time, I'll keep it really short. Um, I really enjoy working with both of the folks on this call, and I know that in order to make sure that we are doing what we need for the state of Arizona, we need to make targeted investments now to build out the future of the biosciences in Arizona. So while a lot of folks are talking about austerity measures, we have a billion dollars in the rainy day fund and we really need to start pushing for spending and investing smartly in things that will help stimulate and grow this sector of the economy. So I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues to make sure that that happens. Thank you. And Dr. Shaw, I, I wanna also say thank you um, for what you've done for our patients. At the end of the day, that's why AZ Bio exists, is to help them. And I know that's your passion too. So um, closing comments. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I, like Daniel, uh, I'll, I'll keep it short as well. Uh, I, um, I, I think um, people are really feeling that it's, it's been a really hard year. Uh, it, you hear it, you hear it when you speak to constituents, you hear it when you speak to patients. Uh, people want things to return to normal as fast as possible. And um, I think that a lot of the work we're doing here um, and a lot of the work that has been done already by not just your group, but the groups all over the world for, um, for bioscience and innovation has 
allowed us to come so far and to give people more hope than would have other been otherwise been possible. I hope people understand that. I hope our kids uh, understand that they're coming up and want to be part of that group of people that go on to do wonderful things for humanity, um, like like you're seeing. Uh, in in the history of humanity, we've really never dealt with something like this, like this pandemic. Um, the last one was like, the real major one was like 100 years ago, and the world has changed so much since then, so it's not even really the same situation. Um, and I, I, I have to just stand up and give a real round of applause to all of those scientists and, and all the people that support them that are working on the solution to this. Um, to get to be able to think about getting a vaccine so fast after something like this hit, uh, it, it's just record shattering. Um, how fast we as, as human beings, as a species, have responded to, the, to this threat and, and tried to find a solution for people and, and put an end to it. And we're only getting better at it, and that's because of uh, all the work that you're doing and everybody's doing to strengthen this pipeline so that we pass our knowledge on and we continue this kind of work. So uh, I, I want to leave people with that little bit of hope um, that that they can, they can join uh, – us in, in working toward a, a much brighter future. Now that's going to be really hard to top as I wrap things up, but I do want to thank Senator Kate Brophy McGee, Representative Daniel Hernandez, and Representative Amish Shaw, MD, for joining us today and more importantly for all of the work that you do on behalf of the people in your districts and the people of Arizona overall. Um, this recording will be um, checked to make sure that it's good and then it will be loaded into the Arizona Bioscience Week app. It will also be uploaded to YouTube slash AZBio1 um, so that it can be shared um, with people in your community, with your fellow legislators, etc. For everything you do, um, both our elected leaders and all of the people on this call, thank you on behalf of the people of Arizona, the people of our country, and the people of the world. Stay safe and have a wonderful Arizona Bioscience Week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Joan. Appreciate it.